Hello and welcome to our next lecture. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me throughout the semester. We have got a lot to cover still, but don't worry, it's gonna be great. We are currently moving on to the fifth lecture. This is the axial skeletal system, different from the appendicular one, which we're gonna learn next week, uh, but this is the axial skeleton. So we are continuing on with bones, guys. Thank you so much for coming with me. Okay, so when I do say axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton, what we're basically talking about is two different sections of the skeleton. So you can see the human body right here, and in purple, the center section right here, this is known as our axial skeleton. You can kind of think of this as like your main axis. Like what can you absolutely not live without, right? Your brain, your spinal cord, and your internal organs. Pretty much everything else, including our phalanges, our appendages, everything that's coming off of our bodies, Technically, we can live without, and some people do, right? And they do just fine. So today we're going to be focusing on those three sections, right? This one right here, which includes the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage. It is a total of about 80 bones. And I do 80 bones. Yes, there are a lot of bones. In fact, there are 206 bones in the human body. And yes, you will need to know all of them. But don't worry, a lot of them are actually going to be really easy. So don't stress on that. Now, what we're going to be talking on next lecture is going to be the appendicular uh, skeleton, and that's right here. So anything your appendages, anything from your shoulders or your hips outwards, that's all going to be part of your appendicular, right? And there are 126 of those bones for a total of our 206. So don't stress too much. Again, you're going to get your vocab list in the lab exactly what you need to know for your exam. But in the meantime, we're going to go over all of them just so you have that information. So starting with the top. And we're going to work our way down. So starting with the top, we do have the skull. And the skull is the most complex bone in our body. And you wouldn't really probably think of that because you just kind of think that it's like a big hole with your brain inside. But really, what <laughs> there's a lot of different sinuses and cavities and sections. And we're going to go through all of those just right now. Um, they are formed by both the cranial and the facial bones. So the bones of the cranium are going to protect your brain, right? They're going to encapsulate your brain and they're going to help protect that. They're also going to be an attachment site for your muscles, say in your neck and your head, any kind of attachment place. That's where you're going to have the, um, the cranium. Now your facial bones, that is essentially your framework of your face. So this is all of your cavities for your senses, like smell, taste, hearing, right? All of those senses are coming from the cavities in our, in our facial bones. Um, also providing a passages way for air, right? Air and food, right? Something that we very much need. Does hold our teeth in place. Kind of important if we need to be chewing. Also very important for speaking, <laughs> funny enough. Uh, and then also anchors any of the facial muscles. Facial muscles is going to attach to those facial bones. Let's talk about the 22 skull bones that we have, including the 8 cranial and the 14 facial so you can see, basically, we're at a side ankle right here. We've got our frontal bone, right? Our frontal bone right here. You've got your parietal, which is going to be this big green section right here. This little guy is known as the sutural bone. You've got the back known as the occipital bone. The temporal goes right here, right? Your sphenoid bones, your, your ethmoid bones, your nasal bones, your lacrimal bones, your maxilla, your mandibles your vomer, and your zygomatic bone. <laughs> now we are going to see this from multiple angles, guys. So make sure that you can label these diagrams and identify all these bones from multiple different angles and multiple different views. Not just the lateral, not just the frontal, right? We do need to know like, what it looks like basically everywhere. And we're also going to go inside this skull as well. Okay. So let's talk skull differences. And we will see this in lab, which is pretty cool. Um, now, we do have what's known in our skull as soft spots. Now, we lose these as we grow and develop, but as you're a baby, especially when you're coming out of your mom's birth canal, it's kind of important that you don't crack your head. You also need to make it out of her birth canal. And therefore, this actually, these sutures or these soft spots allow for increased flexibility. So the sutures are going to be the spaces in between those bones. Well, when you're younger, you have this connective tissue that's known as fontanelles, and these are essentially dense fibrous connective tissues that are kind of holding those different plates of your, those different bones of your skull together. Now, this is important because it will give you a little bit of more flexibility, right? We don't have that in our skull. There's no soft spots in our skull, right? And that's because as we mature, we lose these fontanelles. But as we're a baby, it's really important that we have them because we need to be able to make it out without any kind of damage to our head. 
So these are, again, flexible membranes used to allow us to pass through the birth canal. Um, basically, you can see them kind of enlarged right here. This is anterior fontanelli right here. This is a posterior fontanelli. You've got your mastoid temp, uh, fontanelli. You've got your sphenoidal fontanelli all throughout here. You can see that anterior and that posterior view a little bit here, a little bit better on the superior view. Um, but again, these are these are soft, flexible areas, which is why babies have that soft spot on their head. Sometimes they need to wear a little helmet. And it's because until these basically disappear and they start being uh, reattached back, well, not back together, reattached together and solidified, right? They are that soft, more flexible areas. Um, great for babies, but not something that we want to have as adults. Okay, moving inside the skull, right? We are going to have three predominant fossae. Remember, fossae are like little depressions, almost like little cavities. And that's what you can see right here. We've got the anterior, the middle, and the posterior. Now, your brain is going to sit within that cranial fossa like we just talked about, um, and that's going to be inside the cranial cavity. So, again, this is going to be that anterior cranial fossa, right? Your middle cranial fossa and your posterior cranial fossa right there. Now, we also do have some specialized cavities within that skull as well. So we have things like the middle and the inner ear cavity. We have the nasal cavity. We have the orbitals of the eyes. We have the air-filled sinuses, why it hurts sometimes when you go on a plane and your pressure changes. You get that sinus pressure right here. All of these are different cavities specialized for obviously different things within our body. So a lot to do with our senses as well. Smell, hearing, taste, uh, sight, all of that. All of these specialized cavities are going to be also located inside our skull. Uh, now, we do have about 75 of these openings. Now, sorry, 85 of these openings, excuse me. Now, are you going to have to remember each one and every single one? Check your vocab list in the lab, guys. This is I'm going to go over all of them just so you have them here. But again, I might omit some of them on your actual exam. Um, so just make sure that you're paying attention to what we look at in lab and what we can actually see. Now, some of them are going to be really important. Some we're definitely going to have to go over, like the opening for your spinal cord. It's kind of a big one, right? Um, the blood vessels are going to, again, need to go somewhere to your brain, right? So any kind of openings like that that's really crucial and has, like, the most important function, right? You are definitely going to have to know those. All right, let's talk sutures. Those are those connective points that I was talking about between the skull bones, right? Larger right? And connected with that fontanelle in, in infants. But as we get older, they basically just become these small little, what's called sutures, which essentially is like, you can think of like surgery sutures, right? You're sticking two things together and you're attaching them. So that's exactly what these guys are. Now there are four main ones that you will have to know, the corona, the lamboid, uh, the sagittal and the squamous. So we're going to go over each of those right now. All right. So we're looking at a superior view down at the skull. We've got our frontal bone here, right? Our forehead, our parietal left and our parietal right. We've also got our occipital bone all the way here in the back. Now, the sutures that are going to separate the frontal bone from the parietal bones is going to be your coronal suture. You think, remember, corona means crown. So that's going to be basically right here in the front, right? The coronal suture. Now, separating each of the two parietals, that's going to be your sagittal. Remember, sagittal literally means middle, right? Mid-sagittal, you guys remember that one? Or sagittal really means sides, but mid-sagittal, right? So that's going to be your sagittal suture going right through here, separating your left and right parietals. Now, going along the back here, this is the lambdoid suture, right? Going back here, and that's going to be separating your sutural bone, your occipital bone from your two parietals. Looking at the back view right here, the posterior view, we're coming down here, just, just exactly what we saw, that sagittal su uh, suture. We've got the lambdoid suture coming right here. This is our sutural bone, makes sense because it's going right along a suture. Uh, you've got your big occipital bone, that's gonna be the back of your head right here. And then, uh, that's pretty much it. Let's call these guys. Okay. Looking at the lateral view right here, again, we've got the coronal view. The coronal suture, suture coming down here. We've got that temporal bone right here with the squamous suture. So the squamous sutures are kind of going right over here, right over the temporal. Um, do, do, do. We've got the lambdoid in the back here. I think that's pretty much all of those. Now, there's a lot going on in these pictures. Now, are you going to have to know all these? 
Yes, unfortunately we are. Like I said, we are going to focus on a vocab list. So make sure that you're checking these things off because you're going to have a lot of different things. Like your zygomatic process is basically going to be this area right here. Okay. Your zygomatic process plus your temporal process, which is this right here, your cheekbone together. These make the zygomatic arches. Now I know it seems like a lot because there's this part plus this part equals this part. But unfortunately guys, welcome to anatomy. Right? We have to learn these things because once we get to physiology later on, we're going to have to learn the functions of a lot of these things. Now, a lot of them are just going to be support, especially for the bones, right? Muscle attachment, all that good stuff, movement, right? But we do need to unfortunately learn where they all are so we can talk about them later. Now, we're going to see a up-close version of this one, so I'm not going to go over each one of these. Um, the teron is right here, this kind of like intermiddle section of all of these different bones, uh, the frontal, the parietal the squamous, right? It's all going to be all right here, the, the temporal, right? That's known as the tear on this little section right here, this little inter, uh, intersection. Now we do have the mandible of the jaw right here. This is known as your mental protuberance, basically the tip of your chin. you got your maxilla right here. We're, we're going to go over all of these in different, um, in different views. But this is a great overview of the difference between male and female skulls. So I might have you guys look at two skulls on an exam and tell me which one is the female and which one's the male. Now, if you guys look at males and females, we just look slightly different. Men, you have a typically larger, more masculine jaw, right? That's because that's your bone structure is literally different. So you can see right here, we've got a female on the left and a male on the right. And you can see she's got a slightly more fragile, a little bit more gentle demeanor where he's kind of got like a thicker, much larger jaw, broader Right? That's why males and females look historically different. Right, we do have things like, again, um, a smaller mastoid process. We have a thin, sharper border for the suborbital -or margins. We've got um, usually smaller sinuses in females, smaller teeth in females, uh, larger, heavier, more robust mandible, right? That jaw that I was talking about in the mammals. Right? All of these are really, really great things to point out and see in your lab. So make sure when you guys are looking at skulls that you do try to at least guess if it's a male or a female because we will do this on the, uh, on the exam. And you can see in general, slightly smaller, slightly larger, more robust, especially in the jaw. You see much more of that defined curvature or angle, I should say. Um, so definitely be able to tell the difference between males and females, but we'll practice this in lab. So don't stress. Okay, moving on to the zygomatic bones, all right? These essentially is going to be part of your cheek right here. So right up and under your orbital, right before that point right here. So you can see in here, right here in the green, that's gonna be that cheek part, basically right here and right here. Now we do have several of these processes. Remember, processes are just kind of like projections. So you can see the temporal process here, the maxillary process, the frontal process going up here. This is the orbital surface. Orbital means eye, so your, or, sorry, um, I mean it is, it's your orbital surface, but ocular means eye, so your ocular cavity essentially is right here, but this is your orbital, right, you're orbiting around the eye, you can think of it like that. And it is partially cut off because we're only, this is just the zygomatic bones, this is not all of your other bones that are going to be right in here. Your lacrimal bones, inside your lacrimal bones, these are delicate little bones um, found right under your eye, which is why you can bust it. Um, these essentially... This is where your tears come from. So lacrimal, you can see right here. Um, this is where your tears are going to come from. So they do have a lacrimal sac that is going to gather the tears and help with secretion or release of the tears, I should say. And it's not a great picture, but you can see it right kind of in here. Very delicate bone, right? Right on the inside of that orbital, right? Can be right here. Right here. So you can see that. This is ocular orbital, right? And then right on the inside, this is his nose right here. We'll see a better picture in just a second. A couple other important bones that we need to know. The vomer, this is the interior part of your nasal septum, which we're gonna see, you can't, I can't point it out on my own face right now because you just explode my head. Uh, but we're gonna see it, we're gonna see it in just a second. You've got your inferior nasal concave. Essentially, this is just forming the lateral walls of your nasal cavity. Um, you've got your palatine bones. This is part of the, your hard palate, that first part of your mouth, that hard part as you go move back towards the soft palate. Um, you also have other cavities like our nasal cavity, our parasinal cavities, parasinus cavities, um, our orbits, and our hyoid bone. 
but we're going to go over all of those in just a second. So let's start with the paranasal sinuses. Para, right, meaning two on either side, and these are your sinuses. These are your sinus cavities. All right, so they are located inside your frontal bone, ethmoid bone, sphenoid bone, sphenoid bone, and maxillary bone. Like I said, we would have to explode my skull so you can actually see where these are, but don't worry. I'm going to show you an excellent diagram that you can see very clearly. Um, this is, again, part of your sinuses. So this is what is going to have that mucus lining. You're going to um, sometimes get a stuffy nose. Like I'm still getting kind of getting over cold right now. You can almost hear it because I'm a little nasally, right? That's the mucus and infections. And that's where you get that green snotty stuff, usually up in your sinus, sinus cavities. Super fun. Um, but these cavities are not only used for storing things like mucus, uh, but also to lighten the skull. We don't want a big, heavy skull. We want to be able to move around. We want to not have this huge thing weighing us down. It makes us more mobile. It makes us more agile and all of these different attributes. So here's a diagram that I was talking about. Way easier to see because you're actually looking inside. So we have the frontal sinuses. That's going to be right here. You've got your ethmoid air cells or your smaller sinuses right in here. Just below that, you're going to have your sphenoidal sinuses, right? And then your maxillary sinuses. That's, those are going to be the ones in the cheek right there. Looking at a medial aspect of this, we've basically got, again, our sphenoid sinuses. That's going to be right here. We've got our ethmoid air cells. They're kind of going, it's almost like behind the eyes. So if you've ever had a, a headache behind your eye, that's really, that's going to be these guys right here, the ethmoids. Um, you've got your frontal sinuses. Sometimes you get a sinus headache that can be right there in the front. And your maxillary sinuses right here. I know when I get migraines, it's pretty much for me, it's here and here. I know. Lucky me. All right, let's talk the only bone in our body that's not connected to anything. Right? The hyoid bone. Um, so essentially, this is no direct, and that's what I mean, not connected with anything. Obviously, it's, con it's connected to us. It's not just falling out of our head. Uh, but it's not connected or articulating with any other bone. And that's the important point because this is the only bone in our body that does not articulate with directly another bone. Um, it lies inferior to the mandible. So we're going to see where just where that is. It's basically right down in here. Um, and this is a movable base for your tongue. So this does allow us to articulate things and to move around. Very important when we're trying to make complex sounds and communicate. Um, right? This is all responsible from our hyoid bone. And that's, again, what you can see right here. It's basically right here in our throat. You've got the body of the hyoid right here. You've got the greater horn. The greater horn is usually the larger one or the taller one. And then you've got the lesser horn. So in this case, these are all really easy to identify. And therefore, I could have you just, I could just ask, what would this part of the hyoid bone be? Or I could say, what just is this bone? Okay, lots of different questions we could ask. All right. Now, we are going to go into greater depths of the skull when we actually get to the lab on that. So make sure that we pay attention to all those bones that we talked about, the sinuses that we talked about. Um, yeah, just pay attention to all those and check your vocab list, guys. It will be up online on the Canvas site. So just make sure you're checking your vocab list to make sure that you know exactly what you're responsible for. Now, we talked about the skull, right? Now we're going to be moving on down. We're going to be moving down to the vertebral column. Okay, so we are essentially just talking about our vertebrae, and we are talking about 26 of those little vertebrae stacked on top of each other. Okay, now luckily for you guys, these are not that hard. Yeah, there's 26 of them, but it's like lumbar one, lumbar two, or what people have literally shortened to L1, L2. So if you've heard that, right, right L1, oh, there's a damage, right, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about their lumbar region, and it's the second bone. You just count from the top going down. So that's what we're going to see. Now, so, I mean, obviously our spinal cord is what makes us us, right? We can be large and complicated. We can have all these internal organs supported by our spinal column. We can have a lymphatic system, right? A nervous system. All of these things are very, very important. <clears throat> but <clears throat> probably the bulk of, at least when we're talking about bones wise, the bulk of the importance of your vertebral academy, uh, column is support, right? We've got gravity and we've got gravity taking us down. Right? Imagine if we were just completely straight, like a, like a pencil, right? All of that pressure would be just right here. All of the gravity, which means pressure, 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 pressure going all the way down. So this, basically our vertebrae helps to kind of alleviate some of that pressure. The curves are specifically alternating to kind of take some pressure off, to alleviate that direct pressure going just straight down, 
we kind of spread it out a little bit so we're not so stressed by it. Also helps to transfer a lot of that pressure to our lower extremities, right? Sometimes at the end of the day, your legs are killing you. Like, man, right? It's not your whole body though. It's literally, you're kind of transferring some of that stress to your lower bodies and your lower, your lower legs, I can tell you, pretty strong. They are strong. So if anybody can take it, it's your lower legs for sure. Your, I think your lower legs, just your legs. I don't know why I'm saying your lower legs. All right. Um, what else? We talked about protecting the spinal cord. Also important attachment site for the muscles in your back, right? So we can run around, we can move our arms and our limbs, right? We do need a site of attachment. That's where the vertebrae is great for that. Uh, the vertebrae is held in place by ligaments. And we're going to talk more about ligaments. And we're going to see the different types of ligaments. But really what we've got are what's known as ligamentum flavum. And essentially this is anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. Okay, so we've got front ones and back ones, anterior and posterior, front ones and back ones, going longitudinally, supporting our ligaments, basically, supportive ligaments going longitudinally, and that's what that means. So let's take a look at our vertebrae, right? So we start at the very top. The very top is known as the cervical curvature, right? The cervical curvature basically goes from C1 to C7. This is your first of the vertebrae, right? And we're going to move down to this thoracic region right here, the thoracic region. So that would be your T1 through your T12, right? Thoracic one, thoracic two. That's all that is. We've got our lumbar region right here. That's our lower back region, right? That's going to be L1 through L5. This is where a lot of people are like, oh, my lumbar, I have a herniated disc. I got something. In my... This is where a lot of that lower back problem starts is going to be right here in the lumbar region. And then at the very bottom, you've got your sacrum, right? And your coccyx. Your sacrum essentially these fused vertebrae. So it's like, it's now one bone that was five little ones that have all fused together. And it almost makes this little heart shape right here. And then at the very bottom, we've got the coccyx. And the coccyx is also, again, four bones that have been fused into one. That's our tail. I know, we have a tail. See, look, a little tiny tail. Um, some people have larger ones than others. I can shout out to my best friend who definitely used to have a tail when he was born. People cut it off now or people leave it. I mean, it happens. But evolutionary-wise, back in the day, when we were coming from those monkeys, way, 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 way back in the day, we did have some kind of tail. Obviously not homo, um, homo sapiens like we are now, not even homo neanderthal or, or homo neanderthalensis, right? These are, we're talking way long time ago. All right, now, we do have these different curves, right? So these alternating curves, right? We have concave is the cervical curvature. We have convex, concave, convex. And we do orient this based on um, the basically the anterior side. Okay, so if you're looking at it anteriorly, is it concave or is it convex? That's what that means. Okay, we did talk about the um, cervical region, right? That's basically starting at the very base of your neck, your C1, your C2. It includes your atlas, which we're going to talk about. You've got your 12 thoracic, your 5 lumbar, your sacrum, which is 5 fused bones, and your coccyx, which is 4 fused bones. Uh, and that's at the very, very bottom. Here are those curvatures that I was talking about, right? That cervical one, right? Cervical is going to be concave, thoracic, convex, lumbar, concave, sacral, uh, convex, right? Alternating. This kind of allows for them to support. Curves are actually very supportive. If you ever notice by bridges, a lot of bridges are circles or half circles, right? Those are actually super supportive. You can put a lot of weight on them. So when we kind of spread it out, we're, we're kind of sharing the weight so that not one of our vertebrae is taking too much pressure because a lot can go wrong. And if you've had back problems, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's see. Now your thoracic and sacral curvatures, that comes when you're born. Those are probably the most important ones. Those are really taking the pressure off. Uh, but your secondary ones, your cervical and your lumbar, those come once you actually start walking. Like once you're a baby and you actually start walking around, then those natural curves start happening. But otherwise, the thoracic and the sacral, um, sacral are definitely uh, found in birth. Okay. I talk about increasing resilience, right? Support. Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens if you do have those back issues, right? Something's gone wrong, right? There's a couple different types. Kyphosis is known as hunchback, so you can like think of the hunchback of Notre Dame. So their back over here is overly bent, and kypho means bent. So kyphosis is a bent back. Okay, osteoporosis, 
um, vertebral compressions, right? Compressing in the wrong way, fractures, right? These can all lead to kyphosis. Uh, lordosis is the opposite. Instead of your, the basically the, um, not dorsal, but the uh, superior part of your spine is going to be curved, right? Here, this would be that your lower back is going to be curved. So lordo means bent back. I always think lord kind of sounds like low, right? So that's the lower back, right? Also caused by osteoporosis, um, compression fractures, or added abdominal weight. A lot of women, pregnant women, will go through this temporarily when they're pregnant because they've got so much weight in the front, it kind of causes an overly swayed back, which can cause extra pressure down here in the lumbar region. Scoliosis, sorry, my brother's got this one. I was lucky enough to dodge it, but it's a S in the, essentially in the spine. So scolio means curved. And so in this case, instead of going forward or back, it's literally squiggling from the left side to the right side. So it's an uneven formation of the um, uh, curvature. So instead of it just basically going straight and curving forward and back, it kind of curves left and right as well. So that's that scoliosis that you guys probably got checked out when you were as a, checked out when you were a kid. All right, let's look at basic vertebral anatomy. So we're going to go into each of the different parts of the vertebrae so you can identify some of these. So we have our transverse process, right? Transverse process here and here. We've got our spinose process. That one's going up top. We've got our vertebral foramen right here. Remember, foramen means whole. This is going to be where your spinal cord is coming out. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking straight down our vertebrae. So if that was our vertebral column, we're looking downwards. Uh, this is the body of the vertebrae right here. You've got these two little facets sticking out right here. This is our known as our articular process with the facet sitting at the end. This little section right here is known as the pedicel. The pedicel and the lamina right here is also, these together are known as the vertebral arch. Uh, this is cut right here because it would be, well, it's not cut, but they would be stacked on top of each other. So that's why it appears that it's kind of incomplete right here. But you can see that vertebral arch a little bit better as if, imagine if it were just to come up and connect over here. So we had to draw this little thing in right here. So again, the lamina and the peduncle is your vertebral arch, basically right here. And then the processes stick out from that arch. So you can see this right here vertebral arch. All right, so imagine now I've stacked on top of each other, right? So we've got the top one here. This is the body. We're no longer looking downwards. We're looking at a posterior view. So we've got our transverse process right here, right? Our spinose process. So that was the one that would be sticking up, but it's now this way. This whole thing is known as the lamina. We've got our intervertebral disc in between the vertebrae. That's your little discs right here. Um, you've got your inferior articular process, right? Inferior below articulating process point. Um, your inferior articulating process here. Uh, so inferior, sorry, inferior of L3, inferior of L4. You've got superior of L4 here. So you can see and then superior of uh, L3 right here. Okay. Looking at a lateral view, the bodies, the big disc-like spice right here intervertebral discs right here. So we've got our L1, L2, L3 working our way down. We've got our pedicel, this section right here. This is going to be the intervertebral foramen, which is a spinal nerve exit. We've got the transverse process that stick outwards. We've got the spinose process, which again looks like a point, but the side kind of looks like a, almost like a broad, like flat bone right here. Um, your superior articulation process and your inferior articulation process. Um, this little guy sticking down here that would connect to this, to this, to this, is known as the inferior articulated facet, right? Where they are connecting between the two. Checking out our intervertebral discs, they are made of what's known as annulus fibrosis, fibrosis, excuse me. Um, this is fibrocartilage, right? This is cartilage, right? Fibrous cartilage helped for protection, helping to, um, ease kind of that pressure, right? Do a little shock absorption. And that's what you can see right here. So this is that annulus fibrous, all these fibers going around and around and around and around. On the very inside, you've got the nucleus pulposus. This is like a gelatinous kind of goo, really high water content, really great for that, um, that support. 
Uh, basically, these discs together are about 25% of your entire column. So they are spacing out your vertebrae a nice little amount. And that's important. We don't want any bone on bone rubbing. If you've ever had that, I know some people do, like they have a slip disc or they're basically just it's completely just their cartilage is gone, right? And it's just worn away and you've got that, oh, just painful rubbing. Because you also have nerves in there. And we're going to talk about what happens when you have a herniated disc in just a second. Because that's what you can see right here. These yellows right here, this is going to be part of your nerve system. So you've got lymphatic systems going on. You've got nervous systems going on, especially your nervous system going on in your spinal cord. All right, you don't want to be pinching any nerves because that's when it really, really, really starts to hurt. Now, these guys already talked about great shock absorbers. Um, constantly under pressure, right, when you're standing because you've got that gravity. If you've ever actually noticed you're a little bit taller in the morning than you are at night, right? And that's because in, in the morning when you're sleeping, you're stretched out. Right, when you're doing things like yoga or stretches, which I try to do every morning and I don't always get to it, but it's so good for you. Right? To doing these stretches again allows that decompression. Why it's so important to decompress. Because otherwise all day long we're constantly just being compressed. So at the end of the day, and it's very minor, like your height difference in a day, but you can sometimes tell, especially if you do a lot of stretching. Like I said, my brother with scoliosis, if he does a ton of yoga, he can actually straighten his back just a little bit. Um yeah, because he already had the surgery where he had two titanium rods put in his back to, to fix the scoliosis. Yeah, he broke them. Who breaks titanium rods? I know. That's what my mom and I ask us all the time. Okay. That herniated disc that I talked about. Okay. Basically, what you have is you have your normal annulus right here. Right? You've got your normal nucleus here in the center. But what's going to happen is actually you're going to have a rupture. And typically, it ruptures posteriorly. So, towards your spine. And as it erupts towards your spine, right, what you have going along your vertebrae is your nerves. Okay, so now we start to have swelling and now we start to have pinching of the nerve. And that's really, if you've ever had it, it is so excruciating painful. It feels like electro, like you're being electrocuted. And that's essentially what you're doing. Your, your nerves are being like, whoa, hang on, hang on, this is bad news. And this is where it really, really, really starts to hurt. And that's what you can see right here. So you've got your normal vertebrae, you've got your normal disc right here, and then you can actually see this bulging, right? See that bulging of the disc, it's going into that nerve and it's pushing on the nerve, putting pressure on that nerve. And that can cause just so, so much pain. Okay, so just to wrap up, we do have 24 individual bones. Um, they are seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar. We do have two fused bones. That's going to be your sacrum, five bones, your coccyx, four bones. Starting at the top, you've got your C1 through your C7, your T1 through your T12, your L1 through your L5. Your sacrum, technically, it does go S1 through S5, even though they're the same bones. Those are kind of just like the ridges, right, where they would have been separated. And finally, your coccyx, your C1 through your C, well, your C0 through your C04. Okay, um, we do have a lot of common features when it comes to these spine, sorry, when it comes to these vertebrae in your spine. Um, we already kind of talked about a lot of them. Even though the L1s are gonna look a little bit different than the C1s and the T1s, right? a lot of them are gonna be pretty, pretty close. Now there's a couple special ones that we're gonna learn about. We are gonna talk about those three and those are gonna be found in usually the first three. Um, but here is a great, again, overview of each one of them. So in this column, we've got the cervical vertebrae, we've got the thoracic vertebrae, right? Even though they kind of have some of these similarities, right? They're going to be a little bit different, but a lot of you, pretty much all your C's are going to look similar, except the first couple. Your T's, same thing. And then um, our lumbars here are going to look pretty much the same. So as long as you can kind of identify each one, um, you should be fine. And really, we're going to go over it in the lab. You will be able to especially identify the ones that I'm going to put on the list for you guys. So as long as you know it's a vertebrae, you're good. You probably won't have to tell me that it's T4. And I'm not going to torture you guys like that. But some of the special ones, 100%, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you guys know. So let's talk about these unique ones that are definitely going to be on your exam. You have the C1, which is known as your atlas, right? Atlas of the world, because he's kind of holding up the world. That's your head. All right, next up is going to be axis. All right, and then we talked about sacrum and coxum, cox, uh, coxus already. Um, but we are going to talk about it again and why you guys will definitely need to know specifically those. The other ones will probably just say, okay, is it a vertebrae? 
maybe what is this process or what that process or what that foreman is. Um, but otherwise, these four for sure you will need to know. Okay. So the Atlas is our C1, right? Holding up the world is what they say. And there's a statue of Atlas. If you don't know who Atlas is, it's a very famous sculpture. It's basically one of the Greek gods. I think it was Greek. I think it was Greek. Don't quote me on that one. Uh, but he's supposed to be, again, holding up the world. And that's what, again, is going to be our head. Our head is the world. So it is going to articulate with the condyles of the occipital bone, right? Back here. Uh, it does have deep, superior, articular facets. You can see those basically right here. This big white part is going to be our articulating facet. That's what's going to connect, allow me to do things like this and do things like this without my head falling off or potentially breaking. Um, it does lack a body. And that's really because what you've got coming through here is it's your nervous system. It's your spinal cord. It's literally everything that's going to your brain. All right. So this one does need to be a little bit bigger. So we don't usually typically have a process, sorry, a body um, like that big stacked, you know, round part that we, we learned about earlier. We don't have that here. For the axis, well, you can see kind of, I mean, it's not the best, but these are supposed to be like his arms and like the, imagine the world here. So he's kind of holding it like this. I don't know. I don't see it, but just remember Atlas. He's the first one. Axis is the second one. Uh, now we do have a body right here. We do have a body. We do have these superior articular facets, just like the last one. The transverse foramen, just like we saw before, that peduncle area, sorry, pinnacle area right here. The lamina, we've got our spinous process right here. Um, it's pretty much all the same. We do have, oh, we do have an area of rotation, which is cool. So this basically allows for rotation between the axis and the atlas. Um, I should clarify earlier that the atlas is pretty much holding things up. It's not really doing the rotation. It's the axis that's allowing us to do the rotation of the neck, right? So atlas is kind of like the support where axis makes sense, right? Is doing the rotation. So excuse me, I, do, miss, I misspoke earlier. Now this rotation part is known as the dens or the odontoid process. I always just remember the dens shorter, easier. And um, there were already so many processes, but how, whatever you guys want to do, I will absolutely take either one of those. Now, here is a great multiple view of your atlas and your axis and the difference in how they kind of sit. Okay, so this is your atlas sitting on top. You've got your axis just below it with that dens coming up through the atlas. Okay, so you can kind of think of your dens as going from your axis going through the foreman of the atlas. Okay, and that's what you can see right here. So the two of them together are gonna help with these rotations. And then just below that, you've got your normal C3, C4. All right, let's talk about the sacrum. So we talked about how there are five bones fused together at the very base, very bottom of your uh, vertebrae. However, they actually don't fuse fully until about your third decade. So about in your 30s and when you actually start having that complete fusion of those sacrums. Um, this is another way we can tell by bones, like just by looking at the development of the bones over time, your age. So that's how we can do age estimates. So that's what scientists can use to help determine the age of someone. Like if you find a body and you find bones, you can actually look at some of these fusions and development of the bone system over time. And then you can kind of estimate the age and say, oh, well, based on the skull we know and the hips, we know it's a female. And based on her sacrum, we can tell she was at least 30s. Right, in her mid-30s or mid-age, right? So a lot of these, these things come up over time in our body and then we can determine how old someone is or roughly how old someone is um, based on the development of it, which I always thought was pretty cool. Now, when we look at the sacrum, there are two very distinct parts that we're gonna talk about. Um, what is known as the ala or the ala, ala is plural, so there's are, there are two of them. And these are like those wing-like projections that are gonna be on the outside. Remember I said it's kind of heart-shaped? That's what those wing-like sections are. Um, and we're going to see those in just a second. And then the pulmonary is going to be basically your anterior superior edge of your first vertebrae, which we're going to see right here. Okay. So this is your ala, right? Ala and ala. Ala is plural. So if you see L-A, L-A-A-E, A-L-A-E, there it is. I can't spell today. Um, that's what that means. It's basically, there's two of them. So really what we're talking about is the sacral ala, which is just these wings right here. 
that promontory that I just talked about, that's going to be this section right here, this little projection section right here. That's the base that's going to connect to everything else, your other vertebrae. Um, this is going to be your coccyx all the way down here, also known as the tailbone. These four little fused bones. If we look at the posterior view, we've got our sacral canal going down through here. This is going to be our medial sacral crest, sacra, sacrum, medial in the middle, your lateral crests, right? Um, what else do we have here? I think that's pretty much the bulk of them. Oh, here's basically each one of them. So your S1, your S2, your S3, your S4, and your S5. These are basically going to be those bones that eventually get fused into the whole sacrum. Now I can tell you for the sake of this class, I won't ever ask you probably S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. I would probably just ask you to give me the promontory area right here, this sacral ala right here, identify certain markings like that. Okay, the very bottom of our vertebrae, the last, we started at the top, we worked our way all the way down. Well, we're not quite done yet because we got the front too, we got the front of our body. We've only done the back. Okay, so the coccyx starts down here. This would be the CO1, CO2, CO3, CO4. It's a very little tiny base of our sacrum right here. That's the coccyx. Right, again, usually these bones uh, fuse by the third decade. So in your 30s, they're completely fused. All right, that was the vertebrae. Moving to the front. And in the front of our axial skeletal system, the important one, Cannot forget about where all of our organs are, right? Our organs need to be protected. And again, especially our heart, our lungs, that's keeping us going. Not so much down here, but really up here, we're gonna have that protection of the rib cage. So we're gonna learn about that in just a second. Now, we have a bony frame that would be this guy out here. You can see this cage, right? So you've got your thoracic vertebrae, which are back in the back, posterior, so you're back here. And then you've got your ribs, which are gonna be found laterally. And then right here, this is gonna be your sternum, right? That hard part of your chest right there, that's your sternum. Kind of important one, because it's protecting stuff. And then again, you can see the vertebrae, the back of going posteriorly here. Um, the sternum is composed of the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. The manubrium is this top section right here. The body is gonna be this elongated section right here. And then finally, your xiphoid process. It's gonna be that little tiny point right at the very end. And that's exactly what we can see right here. The manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid, the whole thing together makes up the sternum or the breastbone, the breastbone. Now let's talk about ribs. Now don't believe Adam and Eve because guys, we all have the same number of ribs, right? We all have 12 pairs. We do have 12 pairs. There are seven what's known as true ribs. And those true ribs essentially are connected to the sternum via this coastal cartilage. Remember that coastal cartilage that we learned about that's in that rib cage? Here it is. Right, so it is connecting that sternum to the rib cage, okay, via that coastal cartilage to the rib cage. Um, now, you do have some what's called false ribs, and it doesn't mean that they're not ribs, they're just not connected to the sternum via anything. And you do have two floating ribs all the way at the very, very bottom. That's your 11 and 12 pair. Um, they are considered floating because they really just kind of come out and then just kind of float there. They're really not attached um, anteriorly anyway. Okay, that's what we can see right here. Right, we've got our true ribs one through seven. You've got our false ribs eight through 12. And then you've got, you can't see super well right here, but 11's kind of hiding back here and 12's kind of hiding right here, basically floating. Now, uh, I should mention that eight through 10 are still connected, the, the is coastal cartilage, but not really directly to the sternum, right? So indirectly all the way through here. So these ones are really more considered the true ribs and then the false ribs. Um, yeah, okay. And the floating ribs are literally only attached to the vertebrae, 11 and 12, way down here. So they are floating. It's a terrible picture of, of it. But you can, we'll see it in lab. You'll literally see them. They're basically just hanging out there. They're literally floating. So the manubrium that I talked about of the sternum, sternum, that is that superior section, that top section, uh, this essentially is going to be connected to the clavicle, right? So your clavicle right here. We've got the body of the sternum, which is just the bulk of the sternum. That's going to be that breastplate right here, that breastbone. Um, it is attached to the coastal cartilage of ribs two through seven. Remember, attached to the, the um, actual, um, the sternum, I was going to say sacrum. The sternum attached to the coastal cartilage, attached to the ribs, makes them the true ribs. And then finally, you've got your Z foot process. 
basically hangs down just a little bit like that and does not completely ossify until about age 40. So again, another one of those bones is a great indicator of age for things like forensic science. Couple of the uh, protrusions or notches that are gonna be found along the sternum, we have the jugular notch. Essentially, that's that central indentation at the superior border of the manubrium. Uh, you've got the sternal angle, which is basically just going to be a horizontal fridge where your manubrium joins the body. Okay, so you've got the manubrium up top as it joins the body. That basically right there is going to be the sternal angle. And then you've got the xiphoid sternal joint, which is just connecting that xiphoid process down below to the body as well. So it's going to be that little section right there. Okay. So our true ribs, again, we have seven pairs of true ribs. We have 12 pairs of total ribs, right? Two floating ribs, the 11th and the 12 ones, um, which we did talk about. All right, so let's finish off by talking about the parts of the ribs. So you've basically got the head, the tubercle, the angle, the shaft, and the coastal groove that you're going to be responsible for. So you can kind of think as this is attached to the vertebrae right here. So we've got our T6 just as an example. Okay, so the head, which you can see right here, is actually going to be attached to the vertebrae. Coming off the head, you have this skinnier angle right here, so, sorry, skinnier section right here, known as the neck right here. You've got the tubercle where it's going to attach, again, the artistic, articulate facet for the transverse process, which you can basically see right here. Um, you've got to have the angle, that very clear rib shape, that curvature shape. That's going to be right here. That's going to be the angle right here. As we, sorry, it's actually probably gonna be more right here because as we curve this around, this is what's actually gonna get attached to that coastal cartilage and then to the sternum. Okay, so this would be in the posterior and then the anterior would be right here. And again, moving down here, we've got the angle curving, curving around. We've got the coastal groove just below right here. The body is also known as the shaft, the main part right here. And then this is that junction where you're going to have, again, that connection to the coastal cartilage and then to the sternum. Um, yeah. I think, I think we're good. <gasps> Guys, you have made it through another wonderful lecture. So I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me. We are moving along very quickly. Make sure to keep up with your studies. Make sure to keep up with due dates, assignments, homeworks, labs, all that good stuff. If you have any questions, please email me. Remember, you can always rewatch these videos if you have to or contact me, schedule office hours, whatever you guys would like to do. Thank you so much for joining me and I will see you guys next week for our third lecture on bones. All right, we're gonna be learning about the appendicular skeleton next. So thank you so much and I will see you guys next lecture.